There we go. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Thomas Leota, and I guess tonight we're going to be talking from one heart to the other about revolutionizing parenting. And I'm not sure about the mastermind, but I'll take it of creating champions for life. But what I'd really like to do is I'd like to be able to share my story of how I got from where I'm at to where we are meeting Bonnie and so forth to here today. But there might be something that's really important to you that you might have a question, a comment or an observation. Be sure to type it in and I can get it. I would love to interact with you a little bit and share maybe some insight that's more important to you. But my heart tonight is really is talking about what type of parents out there have done the best that they could feel like there's no end in sight. Maybe no a light at the end of the tunnel. And you've done everything you can. And you think like there's got to be a way. You see, my story starts when I was really young. And before I do get into this here, some of these show up as a Facebook user. So put in your name in the actual comments so I can know who you are. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. But I'm going to take you back to the beginning and I'm going to bring you up as fast as I can. When I was really young, I had my dad. And through my childhood, I didn't really understand 100% why uh, the relationship I had with my dad that none of my friends had with their dads. And so when I was young, my mom and dad split when I was six months old. So I spent a lot of time with better known as my mom. That's my dad's uh, mom. <clears throat> but when I was about three, I remember very distinctly, he telling me this story right around between three and five. I remember asking him, dad, I want to smoke. And obviously the knee jerk reaction it any parent would say over my dead and you guessed it body but i remember this where he would share well what do you mean and he would ask questions so i could tell more about the story about what from a three to five year old's perspective meant about smoking not from the adult's perspective and after the dialogue went long enough, he found out that I saw a TV show and it showed these little guys, these guys that had white T-shirts with the, the Levi pants. And they had that little box of cigarettes rolled up in her sleeve and they were strutting in the movie. And I'm like, wow, look at that. That looks cool. I want to smoke, too. So when he got down to the point, it wasn't like I wanted to smoke, but he said, OK. So he got me a little package. I had it rolled in my sleeve and I was walking around, but I wasn't doing the lighting the part. But he asked questions for deeper understanding. And it really, when I look back at it, it was, I can see why I didn't have this relationship. Though that I had this relationship where other, my friends did not. Because my dad wasn't an adult. He really was a big kid at heart. And that played a big role in what leads up for here today. So my mom would later tell me when I was at that age that I was, uh, well, hard to handle. <laughs> she would, I would be able to monkey see, monkey do pretty good. And I could turn the doorknob and walk out of the house. And I had a dog named Viking. And this dog was probably the same height as me because I was just tiny. And me and my dog Viking would leave in the morning bright and early because maybe the uh, I, I remember the story of uh, it was like the, the garbage man was really up early in the morning. I, I woke up and then I could go and I followed it. And I walked outside. So I'd go down the stairs and my, my dog would leave. And mom would wake up and there's no kid in the house. So they'd call the police, track me down. And I was about six, eight blocks down the street. And the next day it would happen again and again and again. And of course, you know, the, the spanking, the yelling, I, I, you don't know what any of that means at that time. 
But so she would add an additional lock and another lock and another lock on the door. And when she told me the story, when I got older, she said there was about seven locks that I had on the door. And people, when they came to visit, would say, is this a good neighborhood? Why? There's so many locks on your door. He goes, well, no, that's just to see if we can keep Tommy in the house. So when my mom figured this out, is that she wasn't going to contain me. She put me into like sports and that was my up, uh, upcoming as a kid. Put me into soccer, put me into baseball, whatever it was to just put me into something where this energy could go somewhere. And so I played a lot of Little League baseball. That's going to play a key role here in the story in just a few minutes. And I wanted to say, well, here we got uh, Angelus here. Welcome. Uh, Rose, welcome. Thank you for watching. Rhiannon, thank you for watching. Kelly Koob, right? Kaylee. Wow, wonderful. There's lots more. And uh, please, if there's any questions you have, somebody said, I'd like to know about your upcoming or up upbringing. So here's some more. But if there's anything specific, please shout out. And remember, please thank you for putting your name in the comment. Otherwise, you're all looking like a Facebook user to me. So thank you. So mom got me going into sports. Uh, I did all the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the Weeblos, uh, Little League Baseball, soccer. I always wanted to play football, but mom said, you're too small. You'll get hurt, right? I bet a lot of moms out there had a good heart like mine did that wanted to protect their kids from what they perceived might be a bad thing. But I remember being introduced to a lot of the, I guess, the, the drug scene when I was a kid. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> my uncle, he actually was the truck driver for Van Halen. So I got a chance to meet them when I was like seven, eight, nine years old or whatever. I didn't know who they were. But one thing that really struck a chord at the time was, can I go to the concert? And my stepdad at the time said, no. And I'm like, well, why? Because people get stoned there. And I'm like, have you ever thought that your kids could actually think literally stoned? I'm like, why would people be throwing rocks at people? That doesn't make any sense to me. And so when I had one of my aunts, her name was Kimberly. And I remember she would sit on the couch and I'd ask mom, mom, why does Kimberly just sit there and stare out the window all day long? And I remember her telling me about what drugs do to people. And I got a chance to experience some of those things. I'm only going to be just a few to keep going through. But as I got into in the high school, uh, I joined uh, wrestling. I was on the wrestling team. And then there was a time that I was close to about senior. And I had two younger brothers, stepbrothers at the time, Matt and Jared. And it was a time for them to play Little League. They were eight and 10 years old. And I remember my mom saying, you know, there's, there's no dads that are there's no coaches available for the kids or on this team. They got all these kids and nobody wants to coach them for whatever reason. And as you can kind of tell, it would be like, take your kids, visualize you have one, three, four, five, whatever many kids you have, and then double it or triple it. And that would be controlled chaos or just a complete mayhem. I can probably at nine looking back, I can see why dads didn't want to volunteer because now the kids would listen. So I had a chance to go coach and that was my probably one of my first times to really interact with kids of being the only coach to show what they wanted. And so when I when I had the background of baseball to, to work with them, I might approach it a little bit differently with them because we weren't there to like say win. But I got a chance to actually learn about the kids and, and what what they wanted to do. Why were they there? And hello, Brittany. Yeah, good to see you. Ashley, thank you for being here. And, and one of the things I remember is that the kids would be, I remember one, his name was Neil. And he would he would always do what all the parents would yell at him. And stay in the batter's box. What's wrong with you? And, and every time the ball would be pitched, the kid would jump out. And I'm like, huh. 
what's going on here? So when we got to practice, he, he finally find out that the kid was afraid of something. There was always something deep rooted inside that the kids were never looking to misbehave. And so he was afraid to be hit with the ball. So I remember him saying, in the batter's box, close your eyes, take the ball, just kind of tap it at him. You feel that? That's the ball hitting you. Step back to a little bit more, 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 and acclimated to where he could get a full-blown hit with the ball. And I said, you know what's the neatest thing there, Wade, about getting hit with the ball? What's that? You get a free base. That means you get on first automatically. And he became, once he overcame his fear, see, that was probably what introduced the baseball was that each kid – had some kind of fear that they brought to the table that was off the radar. So Little League Baseball, I did that for two years from a senior and first year in college. And so I learned quite a bit about what these kids wanted to do. And one of them was, is like, well, what do you really want to do? And it was amazing. It wasn't what the parents wanted. They wanted to be the best hitter or the best fielder that, you know, we're, we're training them for all-stars or something. Kids had a funny thing. It was like, one of his name was Tiger and Neil. They we want to steal bases, so it was, it was really kind of like find out what each kid wanted to do in their own unique way. One of the kids, uh, Kent, he goes, "I want to hit the ball and run all the way to the other end of the field." And we're like, "Well, tell me more." It has nothing to do with the game, so we let him do it, and it was just allowing the kids to go and then play what was the most important to them. And so that really brought back a, a whole different level of understanding working with kids. Then I got into right around when I was uh, a couple of years out of high school. Uh, I played video games ever since I was a kid. Uh, back uh, probably a good 10 solid years where mom was like, you can't be playing games. I don't want you to. And why not? Well, it's because you got to get your homework done. And I'm like, well, if it's done, then can I? And then she said, well, as long as you get good grades, if you get good, get, get, get all your good grades, then you can play. So I was like always getting good grades. And was what I found at the time is that it didn't matter what the task was. When I had a goal I wanted to do, I could go do it. So I played games my whole life. And she goes, well, if you want them, you got to pay them for yourself. And I remember very young, it was like, so you could earn five bucks to mow a lawn. Wow. Huh. Okay. And so when I was coming up, I ended up having a, a, uh, a job. I started getting a bunch of the, the dads and everything around or the, the neighborhood. I had several lawns that I would mowed. And then someone taught me this one time. He goes, it's really simple to find a job. Just find something that somebody doesn't know how to do or doesn't want to do. And so I saw Leon and he was always, he was a neighbor and he was always yelling and screaming why he hated mowing the lawn. Pretty soon, put two and two together. Now I got two lawns. Then it was another one. And then pretty soon, I started learning about business. My dad taught me that. And so I had my own business. I was delivering newspapers and mowing lawns. And I had a business called Rent-A-Kid. What do you not want to do or don't know how to do? I'm your guy. So I was able to buy all my toys. Waterbed. I was able to buy my dirt bikes that I had. I even was able to buy my first car. And so as I it was able to be self-sufficient, then your independence comes into play. And so before I got out of uh, at that stage, then I wanted to build a car. Mom said no. And I was like, huh, well, they won't let me do it at my house. So I found the neighbor's house that I could borrow their garage, pay $25 a month rent there. And I found out that when you buy a car, you got to have someone at age 18. I didn't know that. So I had my friend Jason put in his name. Long story short, parents found out about a couple months later that I actually did buy a car. I already had it halfway torn apart down at the neighbor's house. And after a couple months, he went, he spent a lot of time down there. I wonder what he's doing. And uh, they're like, oh, my gosh, what did you do? And all of a sudden, everybody just ridiculed and violently opposed. I can't believe you did this. What is wrong with you? And they said, well, you know what? That's it. You, you're you, just whatever. Then, so I took a summer auto shop and we ended up doing all kinds of fun things to the car, painting it all pretty and putting it back together. And by the time I had my senior year, I had this basically a really nice 67 Mustang, all black and painted and all this good stuff. 
But what's funny is at the end of the day, when I end up doing it and it took me a whole summer and a good solid year to do it, everybody goes, we knew he could do it the whole time. So I started learning that when you follow your dream, you're going to get ridiculed, you're going to get violently opposed, and you're going to be accepted by self-evidence. And that seems to be the natural path for all of us, especially for our little genius kids. So coming out of high school, I played video games for a long time. I saw this commercial that was on the news that people were being paid to play video games. And they were called gameplay counselors at Nintendo. And I'm like, oh my gosh, people are saying, you should do that. You play games. So I found out that they were 30 minutes away from where we lived in Washington. The whole headquarters was right there in Washington State. Went up and applied. Before you knew it, I had a job playing video games for a living. What a absolute dream. Every kid thought I was the coolest kid in the world. You play games for a living? Wow. wow. But what I really got to take away from that is I was there for 10 years. And after my 10-year reunion, I got a letter saying, thank you for all your support. And you've actually uh, accumulated over 144,000 calls over a 10 year period. And I'm like, that's quite a bit. You know, when you start breaking down the numbers, 144,000, that's like in 10 years, that's 14,000 a year, 1,200 a month, 300, you're talking about 100 calls a day. But what I learned from doing that is I got a chance to actually coach people with what was most important to them to play the game and they didn't know how to do it and what i took away from that is that some people were just so upset you know can you help my kid and i'm like sure she can because why because because if i don't he's gonna throw this thing through the wall he's gonna damage another controller and so we find out what is it they're doing and when i found out through all these calls there's a pattern people were just so pissed just tell me what to do and then some people are like, I've been at this forever and I just need a clue. But what I found the most about this was asking questions rather than just telling. And so they would be like, I, I can't get by this one guy. He, every time I walk in here, he says, grumble, grumble. And I'm like, huh, grumble, grumble, huh? Well, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What's your tummy do when it goes grumble, grumble? And he goes, hungry. And all of a sudden, the light bulb will go off. Oh, that's what that bait in the store at the shop was. I got to give it to him. I always wonder what that was. So asking questions seems to help other people be more empowered. And so lots of references there. After I was there, but as, as I got through the 10 years there, a process started where I got into my truck one day. And this is a God-driven uh, God story. Get in your car or get in your truck, Tommy. Didn't ask why, just felt impressed to get in the truck and we went for a drive. So I drove up the hill, went down the main road. Before I knew it, I turned left, turned right, and I pulled in this parking lot. And I looked up at the sign and it said, in these really cool little like letters on the sign, it said, which I know how to pronounce it now, but at first I was like, Taiwando. Oh, it's Taekwondo. Okay. So I got out of the truck, I walked in, and the studio's empty. It's like, is anybody in here? Lights are on. And I walked in, and I looked to the right, and there's an office, and it looked like uh, a conjunum, a, a sensei, a, a master was sitting there, just not doing anything, just kind of sitting there. And I walked in, and he goes, can I help you? And I'm like, I looked around, and I intuitively bowed and said hi um yeah i just need to be here i i didn't know why i was like i just need to be here and he came in and we didn't really talk about stuff and he goes well i think it was for like mental strength or so, something i said and he goes hmm, okay well didn't ask about prices just started saturday on a friday and then just went and when i found out later where this was going to lead into the story of being able to uh, create champions for life is that when I, and by, by 1994, after many, many years, I earned my first black belt and I had the same pattern. I'd be really good at something. People would ask me to coach them or help them, right? Baseball, video games, and so forth. And then all of a sudden I got this black belt. 
And I was asked again to coach or teach little white belts. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, Grandma Shi Yi, he, he uh, full, full blood Korean, speaking broken English. And he would say things like you would kick and he'd be like, hmm, pretty kick. Pretty, but broken English so you can get the Korean accent. Huh, pretty kick, Tom, but uh, hmm, too slow. And like you couldn't, couldn't do anything right. It was always very negative driven. Like literally, if I were to tell you that a, a really great class was not getting whacked with the bamboo stick. The whole class. Oh, man, that was like heaven on earth. So I got a chance to actually start teaching. I was like, you know, kids cannot go through this gauntlet. It's no, no. It would be like something. There was a, there was a point right there. It was, it was a, a decision to make. It was like, I'm going to teach and guide these students the opposite of anything negative, no negative thoughts, no negative feelings, no negative energy. And it was like, you can't always say yes because you're taking it to get a mile. You can't tell them no because then they learn to do it somewhere else. But there was this moment that opened up and I look back at it now and it was like, yes or no. Can't pick one of those. And it said, maybe. And, I, and, and now as I realize it, it was like, here's this little student looking at you who could jump and run over, run, run and fly over seven people, jump, fly over them, break a board, land down, and do these amazing things to them. And that maybe was this little student. May I be like you? May I be able to do what you do? May I be able to be able to do what you do one day all by myself without you? And it was at that turning point right there that I, I don't know if it introduced guiding versus punishing, but we look back because that's one of our principles. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is so universal. I guided so many people in video games, the kids in baseball and in the martial arts. And so after several years of doing that, I was, there was another window that was master Charlie brought us down. He sat us down. There was Jerry Ryan and myself. And he sat us down at the, at the thing. And he goes, um, I'm leaving. And we're like, okay, we'll, uh, again, but we'll, we'll, we'll lock up. We'll, 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 we'll teach the class, finish up. You go home and we'll lock up. And he goes, no, I have to go. Yeah, we got it. It's all good. And after about the third time, we say, I got to go. It clicked like I'm leaving. Like a sabbatical. Like, oh. So Jerry was like, well, I, I, I don't really have a desire. I don't have a need to take over to school. Ryan was like, well, I'm running a dealership. Uh, I, I don't have the time. And then looked at me and. Just as void, I was like, I asked one question, uh, sir, does uh, the student, does it at least cover the bills, like the rent and stuff? He goes, yeah. And I said, I'll do it. Not having a clue. Just pure why. Like, why, why, why not? And when I took that leadership role, then all of a sudden, I find myself going, okay, we're in this, I was in this uh, little tiny studio, 800 some square foot. And we had these little kids that would come in. I had a, a small handful of them. And the game or, or the, the, the teaching that was is each one of these kids were just missing life skills. And it came down to this amazing part where we would just play games. And so instead of like sparring, we used to play what's called Taekwondo Tag. Everything was a game. And these kids just excelled. And then all of a sudden, there were big kids. There weren't no adults. There were big kids. And it worked universally for all of them. And it was something that was practical. Because when you're in a sport, there's no theory. It either works or it doesn't. And they came there to learn. Now, during this transformation, we moved from one location to another, uh, an old elementary school that was shut down when the airport expanded. And 
inside it was right around early late i want to say late 90s then it was probably right that was 97 so this was right around 98 97 98 99 right around in there there was a chance to do an after school martial art program and an all day summer camp and how it turned about is the parents were bringing me to their kids to learn self control responsibility right self control is i'm in control of my body my actions responsibility is i'm responsible for my actions and my belongings meaning that how awesome would it be moms that your kids could actually put all their stuff away all by themselves right that they could actually control their body so when it need to make noise they knew when and where to do it they would have they would be able to practice the the fourth belt was the purple belt was the self discipline i can do what i do what i'm supposed to do by being asked only once it's this internal voice that said hey you need to get the homework done before you go play your game nobody says you can't play the game but we always know that there's an abc before you get to d there's always a cause and effect and so these parents were bringing them going could you fix my kid could you fix my kid and and i didn't really know what fixing it meant but what it meant at the time is that I was introduced that they had these labels. I didn't know what that stuff was. I didn't know what that meant. The, and then the kids would come. And so we'd go right through and we teach them self control. It's like, what if it could be so simple moms and dads that each one of the kids, when they first were coming in the classroom, you could show them that you've got five senses and these five senses are just coming at you all day long. Can't turn them off. But what you can do is you can do this, then that. You could actually control your body, sit still and hear, smell, taste, touch, and see all of them and validate them. And then you're next because you're going to be practicing. I'm in control of my body for up to five minutes, which was a prerequisite. And so when I got all these kids that were coming in, I started noticing we'd go to tournaments and we'd be in other places. And all of a sudden it was like, Kids would not, I wouldn't say from our school, but from other schools, you start seeing these kids would run from the sparring match out there. They would run up into the stage or up in the, in the stands and stand there and just be right in front of mom. Like mom was supposed to tie the belt. I'm like, tie the belt. What, why would a child, why would a mom ever have to tie the belt? We, we learned that first day in white belt class. And then you would hear like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. My, my, my uh, little Timmy here is not even ready because I didn't wash his uniform or I forgot his, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his dobak, his, his, the, the, the hoagie, the, the uniform protector. I'm like, Why? you're supposed to have your own stuff done. You can see when I then opened up a summer camp, we had a flood of like about 50 kids sign up first day, all day summer camp. Think about a glorified babysitter for the moms. They get summer off and put them in this thing. And I can remember when the kids would first come in, and I remember that Wade from baseball, they all had this imagination that is just, they're scared of something. And so we'd always ask them, they'd come in and they didn't, they were very uh, sheepish. They'd come into the white belt class and be like, so, you know, it's the neatest thing about being a white belt there, Timmy. And he'd be like, no, the coolest thing about this is you don't have to do anything correct, perfect, or right today. You just do anything you want. Just do something. You can watch. You can mimic. As a matter of fact, you could just sit down and just be there. And at first, you could just see the whole physiology just change. Like, ah, oh, why? What did you think was going to happen? And these stories that were coming, I've heard things like, I thought there would be ninjas coming out of the wall that I'd have to fight, sir. Wow. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And it was like every single child had this thing inside that was stopping them. And it started putting two and two together. It's like, did you feel like this at home? Yeah. And their parent was interpreting it as, as bad behavior. And it was like, these are just missing life skills. No one ever taught them how to tie their shoe or 
tie their belt or how to actually fold their uniform or how to actually get dressed and undressed because they have to go through there. So once we had a chance to get these kids, when I had just a handful of them, it was one thing. But when they started having 30 to 50 at any given day, you got to start having a routine. You got to start creating the right environment. And when they all get into class, you would start seeing like a romper room, jumping around, bouncing around. But there was always one student that could actually play monkey see or follow the leader, or better yet known as Simon Says, better than the other ones. And so I'd look around in the room and, you know, the parents are like, stop, I had just sitting, you know, and they're yelling at their kids and stuff like that. And find the one that's sitting. Because when you came in, the routine was, well, you come in, you find your spot, you sit down, right hand, right, make rock, hard, left hand open, soft, put them together to bring unity, put it in your lap, back straight, legs crisscross, applesauce, back, head down, back straight, and breathe like baby, just belly, in and out. In through the nose, out through the mouth, and see if what you can do is let each one of your senses know, yes, I hear you, see you, smell, taste, and feel, but you're next, because right now I'm in control. And kids could start this for five seconds, 10, 20, and they built up over time. And then Richard was standing, I was like, wow, look at you, little Richard. Sitting so good, back straight, right where you're supposed to be. Wow, you know, one day I can see you becoming great black belt. And all of a sudden, these little ears would perk up. And I wish there was a way to film it. We didn't have it at the time. Every single kid in the room went click, 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 fell right into place like dominoes. And we've been trained to give all our attention to what? The things we don't like and you should focus on the one and feed it. And all of a sudden they all wanted your attention, but they are only doing things that they could do to get attention the way they only knew how. Misbehave and get yelled at. And then it came down to it be like, well, why do we need to do that? Well, every little genius offspring, when it's born, the number one ingredient that it needs, we all need, is attention. And if we don't get it, we die. So there's nothing wrong with these kids. They're just in survival mode. They're in starvation mode. Matter of fact, you'll steal an apple just to eat, and that's not even stealing at the time. And so when you could feed them the attention that they crave and desire, as we all do, universal, no one's except from this. And it was the one that you actually associated the, the attention with. What is the next step? What's the proper procedure of our training? Why are we here? We're here to prepare. For what? For life, sir. That's right. We got to get ready. So talking about many things like that, we would, and, I, and we're talking some really horrific horror stories here. Like we worked with the foster kids. We foster kid would show up. Mom, I just got this kid. I got some money. I, got, I can put him in some things. So she put him in this first day. We did an after school program. We took the vans. We picked them up from school. Bring them in. First day, you would think like, well, I never thought of this. Um, the kid grabbed the other kid's belt from his bag. Had it wrapped around his neck. Lassoing him back and trying to pull him over the back seat. And I'm like, okay. You know, there's some, how, how, how far do I got to go back on life skills when we were just going to be learning some martial arts, like a life skill on how to actually sit in a van. Matter of fact, find the van. The list just went on and on and on. So we were able to back up and back up to find those missing life skills. Every single child clicked right into place when you could be willing to go back and go, you know, no one ever showed him how to tie his shoes. I had one kid that uh, he came in. He, the youngest one was eight, but the oldest one was 10. Not, not together, but they still wore, uh, still wore diapers. I'm like, how did we get here? Because no one ever took the time to show him how to go to the bathroom. And at the time, mom was like, well, I, I kind of enjoy doing this. And like, I seen everything. Everything underneath the sun. So, 
we ended up needing to start to do a routine. So as I started to notice that the kids were goal driven, they were going to do it for me and homework time, snack time, doing your martial art class, being prepared to when parents got picked up. I noticed that there was a part that we needed to open up for a daycare. And what I mean by this is that we'd have moms that come in and they were on a state subsidy. They were like, their kids were so untrained. Let's use it, missing life skills that they went out of daycare, out of daycare, out of daycare, you know, got the phone calls, right? Moms, dads, uh, can you come get your kid? They're hitting, hitting people again. They're, they're, they're spitting on everything. All right. Can you come pick them up? Can pick them up. And then pretty soon they're like, well, we just, could, could you go somewhere else? Short answers. Yes. Right. So you had these moms that were going to daycare, 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 daycare. And they're like, well, my daycare is picked up by a state subsidy. And I'm like, okay, well, so what is that? That's the Department of Social Health and Service, DSHS. I'm like, huh. So you have to be a licensed daycare in order to allow that money to actually pay for the mom. And I'm like, well, just why not be at a different daycare? And she goes, if I were to tell you in a five mile radius, I've been through all of them. And I'm like, okay. So I went to the state. This is like turning obstacles and opportunities. We teach these kids that when you run into an obstacle, everything has a solution to it. So you got to lead by example to go, okay, well, everything, you can talk problem or puzzle. So when we switch to a puzzle, it's just something we got to solve. So I go to the state and they're like, well, you're a martial arts school. And I'm like, yeah, and well, we don't have an application for that. You can't do this. Well, see, can't was not going to be a, an answer. I would not accept can't. Well, maybe you can't help me, but I know somebody here can. So push, 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 push. Pretty soon, you this very first martial art daycare center. That's a martial arts school. And then uh, about a year or two after being licensed and running this program for almost 10 years, they said, well, you have a requirement. Somebody has to have a piece of paper that says that you finished a, a, a class. And I'm like, are you sure? Because I've been running this a long time before we even met and we just did this hoop. She goes, no, somebody that's a director has to have a, 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 a an AAAS certificate, a two-year, four-year program college and i went okay so we came up with a plan to go do that and so i went to the local community college where they gave all these classes and i took two of them that overlapped so i could just get them all done and what i noticed there was a lot of the mostly moms there wasn't really any other guys there it was mostly the the ladies that were there and i'm like okay class after class after class and i'm like so when do you guys actually do any kind of co-op so like if I'm learning mechanics, I can actually work at a shop and get college credit while I'm working like an apprentice. And they're like, well, no, you don't do that. We, there was no classes. I noticed like, well, why would you not have any classes on how to practically applica, uh, apply anything that you're learning in this so-called daycare training, um, license, whatever stuff? That's odd. So you're giving me all theory. So after that was a long time to say, I was like, well, no wonder they get all this training, but they don't know how to apply it. So a lot of knowledge is like knowledge on ice. So after that all transpired, then the teachers came in. I got a chance to have a connection with that CPS, Child Protective Services. So I understood what that really meant. And, and what that came along in the short is that we've got this great protection that we've got three rights for all the kids. Food, clothing, shelter. That's why they're in place. And so if we have three rights for our little genius kids, and this is what parents are starting to get a, a revelation on and be like, look, food, clothes, and shelter. Everything else is a privilege. A uh, bike, is that a right or a privilege? Hot water, right or a privilege? You see, when the child or all the students were working towards that, well, he wants a bike, great. We got a list of all these life skills. Let me ask you here, mom. Can he make his bed? No. Can he put a, can he put the laundry in the hamper yet? No. And we went down the list. So we had to bite the bite, bite the bite, and be like, can he wash his hands? Uh, yes. We got a starting point. Okay. Wash the hands. Now let's go ahead and let's practice. When does he need to wash those hands? Before he, that's right, eat. So we'd set it up when he could practice that life skill several times to earn that goal. 
that's when the parents were like, man, this program is amazing. So my child can't make his bed. They would make it for me because we put that goal in front and they would learn the life skill. Just to plant the seed of how simple, but the farthest thing from easy it could be because we've been trained to do, well, you know, moms and dads, your whole self-worth is on how much you do for your, you guessed it, your kid. So with that all being said, I noticed that after six months, a couple years, parents are coming in saying, you know, I got a letter from the school that they're not in any support classes anymore because he has. He's been up through several ranks. He's, he's got self-control. He's responsible. He's self-disciplined. He doesn't need any of those, uh, what I guess are called IEPs or whatever they are now. And then the other time I would have parents go, you know, he's not on his medication anymore. And I'm like, I don't really understand what you mean, medication. Why was he medicated in the first place? Well, he has that ADD, whatever stuff. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. When we knew that all those life skills went into place, those things disappeared. So when you could sit there and I'd be like, okay, I, <laughs> we'd be out in, uh, we'd be out at one, right out in the grass, out in the park. All the kids would be lined up. They'd all be standing up at attention stance, just waiting. And I could literally leave, go to the restroom, come back 10 minutes later. They were all still there. We ended up doing, when we had our kids, we would, um, we went on field trips. There was a lot of things. And boy, I wish I had eight hours to download everything. I want to go as fast as I can here. So thank you for your patience. I trust that there's some good value here. Then <clears throat> we got a chance to go to the fire station. When I was a kid, I got a chance to go through the tour in there. And they were like, the fire, the fireman saw us go through one of the parades one year. And he goes, oh, you guys can go ahead and uh, bring those kids anytime to the fire station. So we called them up to take take them up on that and the chief at the time goes over my dead body are we ever having kids come in here ever we'll bring the truck to your place and then we'll show you something near and i'm like no i was invited here so come on what is it what's your fear and he's like well if i gotta be straight with you there's a liability here because kids break stuff they get into stuff they don't listen yeah i went down this whole list and i went well you know what if i could give you if I could give you a chance to come by and just watch some of my classes of how these kids are, he did. And then we were the only group that worked with kids that could come do a tour at the fire station ever. Matter of fact, we brought two birthday cakes and had a birthday celebration. And the chief goes, you guys can come anytime because this place is cleaner than when it was when you showed up. Countless ones. We're talking, we would, we could go on field trips and see. What's the difference here is not that we were bribing them to do things, but when it came to the tournaments, it came to the fire station, it came to going down to downtown Seattle. Heck, we even did a, uh, an overnight sleepover at the Museum of Flight. We would practice and train all the proper procedures like a fire escape plan prior to going. So when you would see the other kids and the other students and the moms all running around like just heads chickens with their heads cut off at the tournament, all the kids practiced what it would be like to go for several days, weeks, and months prior to going. So when we actually got there, everything fell right into place. And so it's a matter of taking the time proactively before getting yourself in that situation. And that's what makes so much sense. Now, things are going amazing. And of course, production kind of happens. Things kind of, and I was in a, an elementary school that was shut down because of the SeaTac airport uh, grew and bought out all the property around it. So it was basically a vacant building. Long story short, they chose to sell the property and condemn it, which kind of concluded at the time it seemed like, yeah, but it was really a blessing. Because it allowed me to go on a personal development tour for a while. I studied for many years, spent several, um, uh, been to Egypt, went to China, went to Korea, did a lot of 
training many, many years while I was in the martial arts and so forth. But what it did is it got me on a personal development cruise, which means fly down to Florida, Miami, get on a cruise, be on the Maha uh, in the Bahamas for a personal development cruise, which means everybody meets. Now, you can't make this up because it's got God written all over it. Bonnie's from Canada. I'm from the States. There was two cruise ships to pick from. We both picked the exact same one. I got on. I met a guy named Luke. If anybody knows any of the Luke verses, I won't go into them now, but you can kind of put two and two together. I met Luke. After four days, I met Luke all kinds of places on the whole cruise ship. Later be known, Bonnie also met Luke within the first one hour and interacted with her. It wasn't until the last night. I'm ready to go. It's about 2 o'clock. It barks at 7 a.m. Everybody's off the boat at 8. And it's like, get two, three, four hours sleep. The voice went again. Just go down to the end of the ship, Tommy. Okay. And so I did. And as soon as I walked in, this is the last part of the place where everybody is still up. Oh, man, I'm looking for you all over the place. Hang on a second. I got some of you got to meet. We're talking about Luke now. Luke comes over, grabs Bonnie. Bonnie brings over his Bonnie, Tom, Tom, Bonnie. Oh, and by the way, Bonnie, Tom's got a radio show. This is the Mike and Tom show at the time where we find people that are passionate about their purpose, put them on the air to share their message with the world. And I go, Bonnie, are you passionate about anything? And I'll tell you what, 45 minutes of just pure, it seemed to go by like that. This lady shared her story with the world. I want to be able to save the kids and I want to be able to uh, make sure they could be a somebody for the age of 12. And I want to empower, you know, parents or kids and the whole night. And I went, wow, that's pretty impressive. So I got her onto the show. <clears throat> Several months later, we, we built a friendship. Kind of making this a long story even shorter. She invited me up to Canada. Now, this was another God sent where she got a chance to, she didn't know what my background was working with kids, but I got a chance to see her kids. And this is where you heard her story about where Zach was going to bed, right? He went to bed the first time in his whole life. There was other times when I was in the car, I'm talking to Jenny and Zach right there. We go inside the house. She goes, where's the kids? I saw it in the car. And she's like, she opens the door and goes, what are you doing? Come on, get in the house. And you're like, we're not done cleaning yet. And so she got a chance to see me work with her kids over many months of coming to visit. And so I was working with Bonnie doing this for, for the parents, working with the, the, these things with the kids. And over and then I would go back home. And so she had called me up all the time. And this is so amazing how it just manifested because I never thought this was a parenting program ever. Bonnie would ask a question. I'd tell her what it was. She put it on a sticky note, put it on the wall, put it on the wall, put it on, put it on. And you know, when you put all these sticky notes together, like hundreds of them, and you look back, it's like, wow, it took a shape. And so she said, you know, you got a parenting program here. And I'm like, really? Okay. So I said, well, all you got to do is just find, I don't know. She says, go find one that, that, that does goals. There's all kinds of programs out there. I mean, so she searched and searched and searched and searched and searched and couldn't find anything that was goal driven. And then by the time that it got towards the end of the year, she had that story that God intervened again and said, you know, Bonnie, just walk away from everything and go put creating champions for life on the map. And just like that one time when Master Charlie came in, he sat us down, he goes, I got to leave. Someone's going to take over. She told me the story and what came out of my mouth. I said, walk away from everything and go put creating champions for life on the map. Okay. Not having a clue how. Because we have way too many references is that it's the why power. And when we can activate it in our kids and we can always keep asking it as a big kid. Why? 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 And keep asking why. Why we got to go do this? You see, when the intention's clear, that's the why. The method, the how, always appears. It's like walking in faith the absence of all negative thought 
and feelings. Just going because you know why it needs to get done. And so as we kind of wrap up here tonight, I trust that um, this maybe gave a little insight of where Creating Champions for Life came, how it manifested. It was God taking me on a journey. You know Bonnie's story. We were in parallel for a good 18 plus years or so, came together. Where two minds come together, a genius is born. We put this together and we've been on this journey since November 11th, 2011. 11 11 2011, when that time when she made that phone call. Fast forwards till now. And so, if you're a mom out there that is sick and tired of being sick and tired, you find yourself at the end of the rope of, I don't know what to do. And that seems to be the number one thing that every single parent in the whole journey for myself and Bonnie's story too. But these, all these parents, they didn't know how to get their kid to vacuum. And they're looking over here where in the dojo they were vacuuming. I, how do you do that? I didn't do it. It was their idea. Ask them what they're, ask them what they're earning. And so there is hope. There is a way. And as soon as you make a decision, why do I want to know that this little genius spirit picked me? And why is it that we have this sacred relationship from mother to daughter, father to son? Because it shouldn't be this hard. I've never seen anything in nature struggle. I've never seen grass struggle. I've never seen trees struggle. There's a natural path. And so there is something absolutely real here. And once you've got it, and once you know it, the number one thing we hear from parents that take on this journey all around the world now, and it's pretty amazing because it went from brick and mortar, and it was literally 20, 30 year overnight success type of a journey. I wish I would have known about this 10 years ago when I had my first kid. Or where were you when my kids were having kids? You see, it's never too late. Because at any time, and I've had students come to me as big kids that were in their 70s. Is it too late for me to learn how to control my body? And the answer is a resounding no. You just got to have a why. So if there was anything that anyone is still listening, I see we have uh, double digits here on how many people are watching. I've seen some thumbs, hearts. I want to say thank you for that. But take a moment and click. Put a comment in there. What, what made tonight great for you? What was it that you might have heard that maybe connect a few dots for yourself on the journey, whether you're first learning about us or you've been with us for one, two, three years because this is a lifestyle. I would love to hear what made tonight great for you. And please put it in the comments if you're able to. Let's take a peek and see if any of these are coming. I know there's always going to be a lag. But I'll tell you one last story. Here we go. Any bad behavior we see is just missing life skills. That's right, Facebook user. <laughs> You're absolutely right. What if it could be that simple? Ain't going to be easy. Name walking, riding a bike, driving a car. Not easy, but simple. You did it. I can do it. That's right, Nicole. Monkey see, monkey do. What one mom can do, another mom can do. If Bonnie, one of the best mother, mother infantries in the world, could do it. It's duplicatable. You can do it. And you're welcome. Uh, but it's an abbreviation. Oh, I love it. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. You're welcome. We're uh, helping others complete, uh, completely transform their lives. That's right. You did it. I can do it. There's a solution to every obstacle. You're right. You see every obstacle, the art of an obstacle of perseverance is turning every obstacle into a learning opportunity. Adults talk problems. 
big kids, we talk puzzles. It's the exact same situation, but one has a higher vibration. I just love hearing your story. Thank you, Brittany. Oh, and that was Rhiannon, Facebook user, right? Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, hearing your passion and love for every child you've worked with, I had the same love and passion, so it gives me hope. I can help. That's right, Facebook user. <laughs> I'd love to hear your name in there. Uh, and amazing how you could execute self-control with the whole group of kids. Yeah. When you have the power of belief that they can learn. That transfer of, I know you can do it. Maybe not yet, but you can. Oh, love truly does conquer all fears. Love truly does conquer all anxieties. And I guarantee you, love conquers all doubt. When you move forward in faith, you never know. You never have to know how, moms and dads. How am I going to, how am I, how? You're never going to have. It's a waste of time. Just know why. So when that intention's clear, the method will always appear. All right, a couple more here and we'll wrap up. Going through the missing life skills, the training prior to going to any event. That way they had a plan in place and have an experience underneath their belt. That's right, because then when you're in there, you can be like, what was the plan? Oh, okay, first time we'll do it together. So brilliant. Rhiannon here. You uh, have been a godsend to us, Thomas Leota, and I'll tell you what, I don't take that lightly. We all are godsends to our little genius offsprings that picked us. So thank you for showing up here tonight. And for those that hear this on a recording, one, two, or five years from now, everybody has a chance to make our kids, our genius offspring become the best they can be and share their genius gifts with the world, just like you. So until we meet again, here's to our parenting success. Cheers. Bye for now.